<coughs> so I do not have a PowerPoint uh, presentation, uh, so you can rest your eyes a little bit, and certainly don't feel compelled to look at me. Um, when I don't use PowerPoint in the classroom, I notice my students stare at the ground, um, so feel free to do that. Uh, my co-author and I, David Dana, who's another professor here at, at Northwestern, uh, took a little bit of a different approach to this question of third-party financing. And what, what we try to think about really is the attorney-client relationship and some of the agency costs associated with the attorney-client relationship and how third-party financing might alter, uh, reduce, potentially reduce those costs and how that might affect then the uh, volume and mix of, of litigation. Um, so uh, we start with an observation that uh, really is based on a, a very famous paper by Steve Chevelle at, at Harvard Law School uh, who argued that the private incentives to litigate uh, cases are typically not correlated or just divorced from uh, the social benefits of the litigation, right? And so to take an extreme example, although that's not one that Steve uses, right? In the case of shareholder litigation, uh, oftentimes shareholders may bring litigation that affects other shareholders, right? Um, and if shareholders could vote, they would oppose the litigation. Uh, but nonetheless, the litigation occurs, probably suggesting that the social costs um, uh, are great and, the, and may well outweigh the private benefits. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot of good shareholder litigation uh, that doesn't get brought for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's not in any individual shareholder's interest or sometimes uh, there's collusive settlements uh, with the board of directors when valuable litigation is brought and so on and so forth. Okay, and this actual general model, although it's a rather extreme case because of the coordinated action problems of shareholders and some other things, is actually sort of generalizable to other cases of litigation. If you decide to sue someone that does have impacts on me, I may want you actually uh, to sue the hospital I go to because it might improve the quality of care, right? But I can't make a payment to you uh, to get you to do that and so forth. So even if we think we, we have the right legal rules, um, it's really hard to know whether uh, litigation is being, that's being brought is socially valuable or socially harmful and it's usually a mix. So uh, we don't pursue this avenue of saying whether or not, which is I think a, a little bit what, where Paul went uh, with his presentation, which is whether or not private financing will you know, be socially useful because that relies basically on whether or not you think the marginal cases that are going to be brought by private financing are socially useful. And that's actually um, a hard thing to know. Uh, so we take a step back and we consider uh, sort of the problems inherent in the attorney-client relationship and the, basically the benefits, and we, we will focus on, on benefits here, although I also, I also think there's likely costs, but the benefits that third-party financing uh, might bring, right? And the main benefit uh, we will point to will be that uh, third-party financing may reduce some of the agency costs in the attorney-client relationship. Uh, but in addition, to that, we think that third-party financing may lead to the introduction of sophisticated uh, intermediaries in many of these cases and may actually facilitate uh, settlements. So it may well be that the volume of litigation increases under third-party financing, uh, but when third parties are essentially controlling the litigation, are repeat players, and so on and so forth, uh, transaction costs may well be reduced. And we sort of argue this by reference to the idea that right now uh, we have in many contexts a system of private insurance that essentially operates as ex ante claim assignment. Um, and so the classic example is auto insurance, right? Um, I've in some ways uh, assigned ex ante my claim, a lot of the claim that I may have if I'm in an auto accident to my insurer, right? Who will actually be the one hiring the lawyer for me and pursuing uh, the litigation and so forth. Okay, so uh, that's a basic sketch of the idea. Um, so now let me, uh, let me lay out for you sort of the classic attorney-client uh, uh, agency story. Um, so you have a situation where you have typically unsophisticated plaintiffs, and we're thinking mainly in the tort context here obviously, uh, who have been injured uh, and they seek uh, legal counsel. Uh, and so the plaintiff has one, a difficult time assessing the value 
of his or her claim, and two, assessing the probability of success, and three, the inability to finance the claim. Okay? And so uh, the law at present relies largely on ethical rules, some of which arguably have been co-opted by uh, the uh, bar, uh, to uh, protect uh, the plaintiff's interest. Okay? Uh, but in the classic situation, if you have an asset whose value you can't, you, whose value is uncertain, at least to you, right, and an asset that you can't utilize yourself to generate cash, what you do is you sell it, right, and you sell it through an auction, right? You don't sell it through a private individual transaction with somebody you found in the yellow pages or saw a bus advertisement on, right? Typically you sell it in an, in an auction, right? This is how the value of artwork and all these other uh, 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 assets is determined when there's really idiosyncratic values, right? And in a lot of litigation, there's going to be idiosyncratic values. And even if it's not, even if it's standard, right? You can still think that, well, the plaintiff is unsophisticated and may or may not know um, uh, the true value of his or her claim. So one of the points that has been made in the literature already is that a really robust system of third party financing, either actual claim selling, where the claim is simply sold on the market, uh, presumably the plaintiff would retain some portion of it to give him or her incentives to cooperate uh, with the litigation and testify and so forth. Um, or there's a real loan, a non-recourse loan made, which is essentially going to get you close to the same, uh, to the same situation. Uh, if, if that were done, if we had a really robust system, uh, then you would solve the current problem, if it, indeed if it is a problem, where attorneys are overcompensated on, con on a contingency basis for easy cases. Okay, so this is a case where the doctor saws off the wrong leg, right? Um, so you wouldn't have to be a lawyer to collect a large settlement in that situation, right? And yet a lawyer operating on a contingency basis um, often seems to collect large settlements in those cases, uh, even though the value the attorney's adding uh, is probably not as great as one-third plus costs. Um, okay, so that's been widely noted. Um, the, the point we wish to make is that actually um, on the other side, you know, I, I should point out, this will actually lead to generally more litigation being brought, right? So the recoveries will be higher. Uh, the process of finding an attorney may be easier uh, for the plaintiffs because they simply go to some, you know, centralized location and, and either, you know, sell their claim in some fashion or they hire an attorney who then finds financing uh, for their claim and the compensation arrangement is worked out that way. Um, but there's another side of the coin and it's one that actually uh, uh, Steve Presser mentioned in his talk, which is that the, the nominal winner is at times uh, the real loser, right? And there are times, we argue, that attorneys may have, because of the way contingency fees work um, and that attorneys are reimbursed costs, and there's probably a fair bit of cost padding, uh, there are times when relatively weak claims or claims brought for settlement value may still be brought under a contingency fee system. And so even though at the end of the day the plaintiff is going to collect uh, very little, it still may be worthwhile for the attorney who can assign some portions of his or her fixed costs uh, 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 and push for a quick settlement you know, based on either you know, the, the cost of discovery or something like that uh, to pursue the claim. And so it's actually not privately profitable for the plaintiff to pursue this claim, right, because it's low value and the attorney is going to take the bulk of it in, in costs and fees, um, but it may well, they may well be able to find an attorney uh, uh, to bring the claim. And one thing that third party financing will do, I mean particularly if you imagine this as simply you sell your claim, is it will create a price, right? And you can look at your injury and you can look at whether at either a price or the willingness of a finance company to provide you financing to pursue the claim uh, and make a determination on that basis of whether or not it's worth it for you uh, to pursue the litigation. So uh, introducing some price mechanism, pricing the asset, sort of conceptualizing the claim as an asset, uh, will provide useful information. One, it may spur more litigation of high value claims because you'll get a strong signal of the value. Uh, two, it might deter some people from pursuing relatively low value claims. Most people are averse to litigation. They don't like it. It's time consuming, right? Uh, it's, 
It's uh, often not fully compensatory. This is Abraham Lincoln's point, okay? Uh, and providing a price signal or some other signal through third-party financing uh, can be useful. It may deter uh, that type of litigation. Now, of course, there's something else operating against this, which is that right, people have more liquidity now uh, to pursue litigation. Maybe there's less risk for the attorney if there's third-party financing uh, and so forth. And so uh, you expect more claims for that reason. Uh, you expect more good claims, maybe, because recoveries for plaintiffs may ultimately be higher. Um, but maybe there will be some filtering effect for low-valued claims. Okay, so uh, at the very least, there's some ambiguities concerning the volume of litigation. Most things are weighing towards more litigation. On the other hand, I would think that a really robust system of third-party financing might weigh towards a better mix of claims. And that's something that we need to think about. And those claims, a better mix of claims, right, uh, might mean that the litigation being brought is more likely to be socially valuable. Um, okay. Uh, so that's sort of the, the pricing story, and getting a price and a third party involved, right, might help some of the uh, agency issues in the attorney-client relationship. Uh, the second point is that we observe markets that function like this already, although we, we don't often think about it, right? So the fact that I have automobile insurance, right, means that I have, to a great extent, because of subordination provisions and so on and so forth, assigned claims that I might have if I'm injured in an auto accident, that's not my fault, to a third party. So not only is the, your auto insurance company hiring a lawyer to defend you if the accident is your fault, uh, it may be hiring a lawyer uh, to prosecute on your behalf, right? Um, because they are seeking a portion of, of the recovery too. And to a great extent, uh, even when you're the plaintiff, in these cases, the insurance company is really the one controlling the litigation, and you've assigned it to them ex ante uh, through a contract. And when we talk about problems in litigation, most people are talking about uh, the crisis in litigation. Most people are talking about class actions, right? Uh, most people are talking about medical malpractice or products liability claims. People aren't talking, for the most part, about slip and falls and auto accidents. And yet, those are the claims that actually in which we have a pre-existing robust market of private financing, uh, which I basically say is insurance through ex ante uh, claim assignment. Um, in part also, I think, because the insurance companies are not only suing, but they're also being sued. Uh, they work, uh, they have to deal with each other on a repeated basis, and this may facilitate uh, uh, settlements. Uh, they also keep track of the, uh, very closely, the value of various claims, um, so they have a very good idea of settlement values. And if this uh, process could be expanded, right, if this ex ante claim assignment uh, could be broadened, maybe the same dynamics, I mean, not necessarily, but maybe some of the same dynamics uh, could be at work. You have, again, introducing third party, sophisticated parties uh, who are repeat players, who know the peculiarities of the claim and of the, the local court system, in, in which they operate, uh, and really wind up controlling uh, the litigation. Um, and we then extend, in the, in the paper that we have so far, we try to extend this idea to uh, medical malpractice claims. I mean, would it be practicable, uh, even if we don't have a market uh, for uh, a really robust market of private financing or a way to sell claims, is it practicable to assign claims ex ante, right? You could imagine, for example, uh, if you go in for a surgery, uh, the hospital uh, sells you complications insurance, right? So uh, they agree to uh, pay your, any future medical costs arising from the procedure you're about to undergo. Uh, maybe you buy disability insurance from them and so forth. And in that way, you actually assign your claim. Uh, uh, Maybe may the hospital, maybe a third party insurer. Uh, who will then interpose themselves if a complication does arrive, if there is malpractice, right? There'll be a subordination clause. You collect right away. That's great for you if you're an injured plaintiff, right? And the litigation is really dealt with, and there'll be unpleasantries associated with it. Not all of them, because you, you'll, you'll be a witness still. Uh, a lot of the unpleasantries associated with it will be um, uh, taken over uh, by a third party. And in fact, because of uh, subordination provisions and private health insurance, uh, this actually uh, happens. 
Uh, one of the most common ways it happens is that insurance companies, private health insurers, will refuse to pay if they suspect that treatments were done negligently or uh, the, the follow-up care was really care to solve uh, an issue of medical malpractice provided early on. And this is actually a claim assignment. You've assigned your medical claims, essentially, to your private health insurer through a subordination clause. And the private health insurer is actually in a really good position to negotiate with a hospital because they say, we're not going to pay. And if you want to collect, you sue us, right? And we got lots of lawyers, right? You got lots of lawyers, but we got lots of lawyers too. It's much harder for an individual paying for his or her own health care, right, to decline to pay. The, the hospital will sick a collection agency after you uh, and so forth, maybe go after your credit rating. Um, you might get involved in litigation very early. Uh, here's another point. Uh, the Medicare uh, has recently announced that they're going to stop reimbursing hospitals for treatments uh, for infections, right? Uh, and again, this is, we can think about this as a partial ex-ante claim assignment. Uh, Medicare is taking the position that infections arising from surgeries are always negligent, and we're simply not going to reimburse you for them. And a number of private health insurers have actually taken the same tack. Okay. And again, is this creating, uh, this isn't litigation, right? It's not necessarily leading to litigation, uh, but it's a way that ex ante, you've assigned claims and you've assigned them to a sophisticated third party who has a credible threat of defending itself if it declines to pay. It's not fully compensatory here, obviously, but it has a credible threat to defend itself if it declines to pay. It has a repeated interaction with the hospital, okay, and it may well be socially valuable for the rest of us if hospitals stop killing people through infections. And this is what the tort system is supposed to do. It's supposed to give an incentive, right, for hospitals to stop killing people through negligent infections. And uh, this third party intermediary is really using that background of tort law, right, that this is the hospital's fault, they should be paying for it, right, uh, to assert itself in the place of the plaintiff uh, and uh, protect, to some degree, the plaintiff's interest and also, I would argue clearly, uh, generate something that's socially valuable, right? It's imposing the incentives on hospitals that the tort system ideally would be imposing but is not uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is that it's very costly and very hard to prosecute medical malpractice claims. Okay. Uh, so that's the basic uh, idea we're pursuing. Um, I don't think that it's proof that a robust system of third-party financing will improve tort law or, or solve all the problems of the, of the uh, attorney-client relationship, um, or for that matter, um, these benefits may well be outweighed by increases in costly class actions and other types of litigation. Uh, but I think it's something uh, we need to think about seriously, and we need to think about maybe if, if there's barriers, legal barriers, and maybe political barriers to uh, third-party financing, maybe ex-ante claim assignment, uh, to the extent we can do it, actually works better, right? Uh, it actually works better uh, because you're introducing right away um, sophisticated intermediaries, uh, repeat players uh, who can evaluate the probability of success very quickly. They have huge legal departments uh, that try to do this uh, and also can negotiate more credibly uh, with some of the institutions with whom they may have pre-existing and ongoing uh, relationships, particularly in case of medical malpractice, the private insurers and the hospitals. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Max.